What's up, YouTube? It's your boy Cody back for another Off the Schneid UFC preview prediction and betting tip episode. If you're here for the first time, do me a huge, huge favor. Hit that like, subscribe, and uh, turn on notifications so you get notified every time I put on a video. Um, this week, I'm going to do a couple things a little bit differently. Well, not not with the show, but as far as betting is concerned, you might be wondering why I'm wearing a, an LSU jersey uh, during a UFC episode. That's a little weird. It's because my boy, Dustin Poirier, you may not know, but he's from Louisiana, uh, probably a Louisiana State fan. I'm not sure, but this is my Bur my Joe Burrow jersey. I am obviously a Bengals fan, so there you go. As far as the betting is concerned, follow me along on Twitter at Cody Woodman right there. I'm probably going to pull it back this week. I need to show a profit. I had two losing episodes or two losing cards in a row, which is not fun. I had that big win a couple weeks ago, but uh, you got to show some wins. So I'm going to pull it back to two, three, maybe four runners and then make one crazy parlay kind of dart throw. So follow along at Cody Woodman right there. So we've got UFC Fight Night on ESPN 12. My boy Dustin Diamond Poirier versus Dan. And the hangman hooker should be a good night of fights there's a lot of matchups uh interesting matchups stylistic matchups and that sort of thing so let's jump right into it don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button and away we go all right for the first fight of the night you might notice by the way let's uh let's start with that you might notice i switched up my graphics um i just got sick and tired of the ufc website being a piece of crap to be honest so uh i switched over to uh, this is from topology um I, I quite like their graphics a little bit more. I couldn't fit the pictures of the, the fighters in, so we'll have to make do with just their names and uh, all the stats that you see here. So we'll start it off with uh, Jin, Yi, Jin Yu Fry. Um, uh, interesting thing, this, this fight was only put together about a week ago, so neither of these girls had a camp for each other. They're both late replacements. Um, neither one was scheduled to be on this card, but uh, it should be an interesting fight either way. The let's start with Jin Yi Fry, Jin Yu Fry. So uh, former Adam weight, which is 105 pounds. That division doesn't exist in the UFC, obviously. So she's bumping up short notice to, uh, to straw weight 115. That's the minimum in UFC, anyways. I don't really see them going with a 105 pound division anytime soon. I think that'll stay uh, niche to Invicta. But uh, she's an interesting, interesting fighter. Um, Southpaw, which is interesting. Southpaw versus Orthodox we got here. She was the Invicta and Atomweight champ, um, which she defended, one defended a few times. Um, the, the weird thing about her, the crazy thing, and that's maybe indicative of why this division won't end up in the UFC. In her last seven fights, she fought only four, three, four girls. Uh, three girls she fought twice in that span. Um, Ashley Cummings, uh, Mina Grusander and Ayaka Hamasaki. They, she fought both those girls twice. Uh, went four and two in those fights, but it's just interesting. And like I said, it might be a bit addictive about why that won't end up in the UFC. Um, she had a nasty KO in a viral video of the, the, her knockout of Darla Harris. Has over two and a half million views on YouTube. You can go check that one out. It's uh, pretty vicious. Um, so there you go. There's there's Jin Yu, Jin Yu Fry. Uh, should have a little bit of a reach advantage. It's interesting. They're similar sizes, but they definitely carry their weight a little bit differently. So we'll move over to Kay Hansen, who's definitely a little bit thicker in the hips and the lower body type of thing, which is great because she's a wrestler. Wrestling, grappling, jiu-jitsu, both train at jiu-jitsu gyms. Um, but before 10th Planet, uh, Kay Hansen was with Team Punishment. Yes, Tito Ortiz is Team Punishment. Um, so she's got a very good wrestling and grappling jiu-jitsu base. Striking's a little bit weak, um, and that's that's definitely a concern. But uh, considering she, she should be the bigger girl all around, quite a bit younger too, by the way, 15 years, 15 years difference in age. Um, not that that extremely matters, but, you know, it's just... It's, inter it's a little bit interesting because she's at that weight class at that age and um, uh, Fry's been making 105 at her age. So that is a little interesting, not that it's extremely gonna matter. Um, I think Fry will have the advantage in the stand-up kickboxing and 
uh, Hanson needs to get her hands on her and grapple and wrestle. Um, so she could eat a, a kick or a knee or an uppercut or something like that on the entry, but I really don't think so. I think that she's going to get her hands on her, take her down, grapple her, wrestle her. Most likely going to eke out a decision. So I'm going to be picking Kay Hansen in this one. Um, I don't think that there's going to be a finish. I'll say that. Of the two, five of Kay Hansen's six wins have come via stoppage. Her only, uh, her last win was the only fight that hasn't been, uh, she didn't win by stoppage. And then um, Jin, Yu, Jin Yu Fry only had that one knockout. It was vicious, but it was extremely early in her career. It was her second pro fight. And... Um, only two submissions on top of that so she's not exactly a finisher even at that atom weight and you know i talk about it on the show all the time about um just the inability to be able to drop somebody at that weight class they're not throwing a huge amount of power so i really don't expect either of these girls to stop each other um what i think happens is Kay hansen gets a hold of her pushes her up against the cage, gets her to the ground eventually, and just grinds out a wrestling ground and pound type of a type of a win. I could very much see this go to decision. So let's take a look at the betting lines here. We got 1.58 for Kay Hansen in the money line. That's a decent price. I just, I, I might avoid this. I might avoid this completely, to be honest with you. Um, there's not a ton of value is the only thing. Fight to go the distance, 1.4, you could go with that. If you want to just take Kay Hansen in a decision, 2.4 on your money, throw it in a yeah, two, three, four parlay runners, sure. There's nothing wrong with that. I really wouldn't, I really wouldn't touch the the knockout money or the finish money for either girl. Again, they're they're just at that smaller weight class, and Fry was fighting even smaller. So I just don't expect them to knock each other out there unless there's some sort of you know submission, but even then like i i just don't see it if i'm being honest i think this probably does go to a decision so if i do touch it i'd probably go over one and a half and throw it in a in a dart throw type parlay or even you know if you got three runners and you want to juice it up a little bit over one and a half rounds 1.18 it's not huge but i think that there's an extreme likelihood that it goes over a round and a half um so it kind of feels like free money but there you go. There's your breakdown. Um, yeah, the decision money for either girl, to be honest with you, is pretty decent. I'm picking Kay Hansen to win this fight. 1.58 on your money is not too bad either. But uh, there you go. Let me know what you think in the comments and let's move on. All right, next up, we got a really good fight. A really, really, really fun one. This should uh, this should be a bit of a burner, a barn burner for the early prelims. We've got uh, Yusuf, the Moroccan Devil, Zalal versus Jordan, native psycho Griffin. I quite like both of these guys. Um, we'll start with uh, Yusuf Zalal. Um, he trains out of Factory X, which is a very, very good gym. Uh, Brandon Royval just came out and had a, had a fantastic 125 fight the other weekend. Um, orthodox switches extremely often and very well on his feet. Uh, he moves really well with some unorthodox striking and throws a lot of different looks at his opponent. He can wrestle and uh, has got a lot of variety of submissions. So if you're looking at his different, um, they're, they're mostly chokes, bravo, rear naked, guillotine, arm bar. He's got a good variety of, uh, of finishes. A little bit earlier in his career, but... To be honest, that's usually what you see is, is the, as your level of competition increases, it's tougher to finish these guys. It's no secret. It's, it's pretty obvious. Um, former LFA guy, uh, second fight in the UFC here. Last time out in his debut, beat Austin Lingo, who, who I think that's his first loss. Yeah, seven and one now. They're both debuting, both LFA guys. Surprising they didn't fight in LFA, but, um, but there you go. Uh, two losses. One was a split against Matt Jones and uh, Jaime Hernandez uh, just after that with a flying knee. So he's an interesting guy. I really I really like him. Um, I really like what he can do. Um, I was surprised that he would go for takedowns like he did in the Lingo fight. I didn't think he could quite wrestle that well. But Lingo got a little tired in, in that fight. So it kind of is indicative of what happened there. Uh, move over to Jordan Griffin, Southpaw. So we got another Orthodox versus Southpaw, but 
uh, Zalal switches so much that it might not matter, and he's pretty good from both both ways. So it should be it shouldn't matter a ton. Uh, he's very tough and resilient with a great gas tank. This guy lost all all three first rounds in all three of his UFC fights. So first his debut, he's a Dana White contender series guy. He won on the contender series first round rear naked choke. Then in his debut, and this is pretty tough too. He fought some tough guys. In his debut, he fights Dan Ige, who's uh, fighting uh, Calvin Cater in a couple weeks here on Fight Island, which is a very good fight. But to fight Dan Ige in your debut, that's pretty tough. Then he goes and fights Chaz Skelly, who's only got four losses. Like Chaz Skelly is a very, very, very good fighter and it's kind of underrated. And then um, in his third fight, he beats TJ Brown with a second round uh, guillotine but he absolutely lost the first round in that one so he's kind of a slow starter um, he's a very entertaining fighter extremely tough hard to finish and uh, there's no quit in this kid so this should be a good one um, I, I think that there's a good possibility this goes to the decision as well um, again they're not huge guys 145s though but from what I could tell from the tape, they're not, you know, throwing haymakers and and their their stats kind of show that they're not knocking out a ton of guys. Five of 18 wins for uh, Griffin and two of eight for Zalal, but they're all relatively early. Zalal did have that flying knee. Um, and then for Griffin, they're all relatively early in his career. So they're both more known for uh, submissions so I could see this being played out on the ground. Um, my only, my only, my big concern is with Jordan Griffin and his propensity to lose the first round. You really don't want to start fights, especially in the UFC, down around, which is what he's done in all three of his fights. Um, and then you got a guy like Zalal that can just grind you down if if he's ahead. You know, he's not going to at least in his debut, he didn't take too many risks and uh got up in the fight and stayed up and continued to stay active it's not like he was laying praying or anything like that he definitely had an exciting fight and he's an exciting looking fighter um so trains in trains in uh, denver as well at factory x like i said very good gym trains at elevation so i'm taking yusuf zalal in this um, again, my biggest concern is with Griffin, and uh, and he's just shown that he he. I'm not saying he gives away the first round. Obviously, that's not the case, but he has lost the first round in every single one of his UFC fights. This will be his fourth, and he's got to start a little quicker. So the first round will sell, tell us a lot about this fight. Might be one a good one to live bet. If I'm being honest with you, if um, if Griffin loses the first round, I would go ahead and live bet Yusuf Zalal to win almost for sure if uh he comes out and has a good first round as long as it doesn't get stopped in the first which i don't think it will if he has a good first round and maybe takes the takes the first round at least in your opinion might not be a bad idea to bet on uh jordan griffin i'm picking yusuf zalal like i said i just think that um he can get ahead in the fight and stay ahead in the fight and he can get get the better of him on the feet and he's no slouch on the ground either i think griffin might have a, an advantage on the ground i mean he's a, a um, rufus sport guy duke rufus so he should be pretty good on the feet i just think zalal will get the better of him there he's a little bit longer lankier that kind of a thing they're they're i mean it says that they're the same height and reach is basically the same but I really feel like um, Zalal will be able to fight a little bit longer and get to him with that jab and uh, his just his longer limbs. I, th I think he will be longer. Um, a lot of times you do see that and it's just quicker to the punch type of thing. It's not a reach advantage. It's maybe just a quickness advantage. And if that is the case, which I think it might be, I think Yusuf Zalal has that. So take a look at the lines. It's almost a coin flip. Um, 1.8 on your money for Zalal. 2 to 1 on, on Griffin. If you like Griffin, I'm not trying to talk anybody out of Griffin. That's for sure. Um, finish money. I'd be nervous about that. That's for sure. Um, it's tough to find a finish with these guys. I, I, I can't really find one if I'm being honest. Uh, I think they'll kind of neutralize each other on the ground for the most part. And I, I don't think either one can knock each other out. I just... I think that there's a good chance this goes to a decision. So 1.66 for a decision, um, 2.75 for Zalal in a decision. Yeah, I don't mind that. Again, like like I said, it might be a decent fight to live bet, like first round live bet after the first round. You know what I mean? 
Uh, over one and a half rounds, 1.3. You got a couple runners in a parlay, nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah, that's about all the value I can find. There's no harm in taking decision money for either guy, uh, depending on who you like. I like Zalal. I'm not sure if I'll even bet that though, the 2.75. I might just go with the 1.8 because I do believe Zalal wins this fight. So I, I check my bet slips, but should be a good one. It should be a fun fight. Let's move on to the next one. Next up, we've got a really good one. I think this is going to be a really good fight. Uh, we've got Takashi Sato versus, versus uh, Ramiz Brahima. This should be good. I really am excited about uh, Brahima in this one. Uh, we'll start with Takashi Sato. Um, I think he's training in Orlando or in Florida somewhere. Jacksonville, maybe. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if that's with American Top Team. I'm really not sure where he's training, but he's obviously in the States. Um, obviously. So I'm not sure where he's training, but it's somewhere. In, I know it's somewhere in Florida. Either way, he's a uh, Southpaw creative striking striker with good timing. Um, he can really time that left hand, like I said, southpaw. Karate style, bouncing on his toes, good in and out, big one-two, classic kind of karate style. Um, again, really good straight left with, with some really solid power. Uh, in his, uh, in his UFC, de UFC debut, he knocked out Ben Saunders, but to be honest, at this point in Ben Saunders' career, everybody's kind of doing that. So that's not a huge, huge thing. His fight before that, he was a Pancras fighter. Uh, fight before that, Matt Vale, uh, Australian guy who's actually not too bad. Uh, he knocked him out in the second round. But um, his fight after the Saunders fight in the second UFC fight against Bilal Muhammad, um, who we just saw last weekend, rear naked choke loss in the third round, which is actually kind of interesting. So if we look at three, sorry, uh, Sato's last four fights, two have ended in the submission loss. There was only two of his career. Um, they were to, to decent fighters, especially obviously Bilal Muhammad. Muhammad, I really, really like. Um, but two submission losses in his last four, and he kind of looked like a fish out of water a little bit in that uh, Bilal Muhammad fight. So that's a big thing for me. We'll move over to Ramiz Brahima. He, uh, he was supposed to fight on the Contender Series this summer. Um, that got moved up, obviously. Or he's supposed to fight in it last summer, I think, something like that. And then in a medical, they found a tumor in his eye, which is pretty scary. Uh, it turned out to be uh, operatable, and um, he's all right, and it's it's okay. It's it's it, his vision's fine, and it's out. It's all good. Well rounded, great gym with Fortis MMA. Um, he teaches there as well. Here's a big thing. Here's a big thing about this fight. He is a former IBJ, IBJJF no-gi world champion. No-gi world champion. That's a big thing for me. Um, in his last time out, first round triangle choke, time before that, and I, I couldn't find his two losses. I could only find a couple of his fights, and I couldn't find his two losses, but supposedly they were extremely close and extremely exciting fights, and he could have very easily taken them. Um, I couldn't find them. I couldn't watch them, so I can't really say that for sure, but they were unanimous decision losses, which makes it makes me like, how could they have gone his way, kind of? I don't know, but that's just what um, I kind of heard in other fights that he had that he could be still he could be 10 and 0 he could be undefeated but again they were unanimous decision losses so that doesn't really make a ton of sense but uh an lfa guy um and he just he's a beast so all eight of his wins have come by submission and only one of them was outside of the first round so i really like uh brahima to win this fight the line has already moved away from him. So it started at like 2.4, something like that. It's already moved away from him. Um, I think obviously smart money got in there. I probably should have thrown a bet together a little bit earlier on him. I kind of wish that I did because that's good value. I, I almost wish I just bet it straight up on that value, but it is what it is. Um, so I think he takes him down. I think it's only a matter of time before he takes him down. I think he's extremely motivated for this fight. I've watched a few of his interviews and um, I'll actually tag a, uh, 
uh, what's it called? I can't remember what the YouTube channel is, but he made a couple great, really good videos, and I'll tag it in the description. You can uh, you can see that about uh, Ramiz Berhima. And uh, yeah, I think he gets this win. I absolutely think he gets this win. I like him to probably stop him too. So um, I don't think I would round bet it, but the money line is good value right there. 2.1 on your money for Brahima. I'll definitely be betting that, absolutely, because there's a decent possibility it goes to a decision. Um, at the, considering it's at this level, right? Like once you get to the UFC, you find out the fighters are at another level. Um, and he might just be able to neutralize him on the ground. I don't think so. I think he stops him. I'm probably going to be betting three to one on my money on a stoppage as well. Um, to go the distance, I mean, you could you could just say no, but I don't I don't suspect Sato just drops Brahima or stops him. He's certainly not going to tap him out, and uh, I don't see him knocking him out. So it basically all hinges on Brahima. So I'm not going to take. No, it's not like a heavyweight fight where you know a guy either guy can drop each other at any point. I'm gonna take Brahima in a finish, and that's pretty much it. I don't think I'll even hedge with Sato. I really don't think he wins this fight. I might not put Brahima in all of my parlays, but pretty close. I think that this is a good value play right here. Um, the round betting over one and a half. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna round bet it unless I go. I mean, even under two point five. That's not really. I'm not loving that. I, I don't think I round bet this at all. Unless you think there's an extremely quick stoppage. But even if you do, you might as well just take the stoppage money. 3, point, 3 to 1 over 2.37 on your on your money. So you might as well just take Brahima in a stoppage if you think there's going to be a stoppage. I, again, I do not think that Sato is going to be capable of stopping Brahima. That's kind of my big thing. I don't think he's capable of stopping him. And I absolutely think that Brahima can tap out uh, Sato, considering he's been choked out. Another thing, the Bilal Muhammad submission, that rear naked choke by Bilal Muhammad, that was the first submission victory of Bilal's career. That's kind of crazy to me. That, considering the way Bilal Muhammad fights too, that's another story altogether. But considering that's his only submission win and it came against Sato, I like Brahima in this. So... Yeah, let me know what you think in the comments. I'm extremely excited for this debut for uh, Ramiz. I'm super excited to see him fight in the UFC. I want to see more of him, and I can't wait. So hopefully he gets through this quickly and wins us some money. So let's move on to the next fight. Next up, we've got a heavyweight bout. We've got Felipe Monstro Linz versus Tanner the Bulldozer Bozer, Canadian kid from Bonneville, Alberta. If you don't know where Bonneville is, I don't blame you. It's uh, north east of Edmonton and northwest of Lloyd Minster or Lloyd Minster um, yeah it's in the middle of nowhere basically obviously he lives in uh, the Edmonton area now trains at Hayabusha training center as well as with the shaved bears um, Teddy Ash and uh, those guys everybody they probably all train together up in Edmonton I'm sure but he's a local guy I like him you gotta like him Canadian kid Love it. So let's start with uh, Felipe Lins. He was the PFL million dollar winner a couple years ago for, in the heavyweight tournament. He beat a bunch of um, former UFC vets um, in relatively impressive fashion. He either knocked them all out or finished them. One was a guillotine and the rest were punches, TKO to punches and knees and such. Um, but he has been KO'd and has been KO'd with kind of glancing blows, not not heavy, heavy, heavy shots. And in his last time out against Andre Olofsky, I was really not impressed by his um, kind of lack of volume. Uh, neither guy is extremely a volume striker, but Tanner Bowser definitely moves better than Felipe Lins, especially just right now in their careers. Uh, my big concern, I got a couple concerns about Felipe Lins. Uh, number one, he won a million dollars. That's a huge payday. That's a huge, huge, obviously. That's a massive payday. So where, and he's 34 years old. Where is his going on 35? Is he going to be motivated? Is he going to be motivated to fight, you know, however many more times and make a push towards the belt after losing to Arlovsky, which you really can't do if you're trying to be, you know, you just can't be losing to Arlovsky. I'm sorry, no disrespect for, to Andre Arlovsky, but 
these younger guys, you got, you know, he's kind of a gatekeeper type type of guy. You got to beat a guy like Andre Lofsky. You kind of just do. Um, so where's his motivation at? And then the other thing is he was out a couple times with a knee injury. I couldn't find which knee it was. I really would like to know which knee it was. He's an orthodox fighter. So if it was his left knee, AKA his lead leg, his lead knee, that would, I would be most certainly betting on Tanner Bozer. I, I will regardless, most likely we'll get there. But um, if it was his lead leg that he had those knee troubles with, I'd be concerned if I was him. Um, moved to Tanner Bozer. He, uh, he's a uh, light on his feet, pretty like moves really well for a big dude. Um, throws a ton of leg kicks. Orthodox fighter, but he can switch. He can switch and he throws this kind of over uh, overhand right, lead overhand right when he switches. Um, yeah, ton of leg kicks. Doesn't need a ton, doesn't need to hit a ton of leg kicks. One, two, three, maybe. That's all kind of all she wrote. Doesn't need a ton to cause damage. Um, and uh, even so in his last fight, last last time out against Cyril Gain, he had his respect kind of off the hop, which is pretty awesome because Cyril Gain is one of the best kickboxers in the heavyweight division right now. Um, he's not losing to anybody. He's undefeated, I think. Maybe he's got one loss earlier in his career. No, 6-0, and oh, undefeated. So he kind of, like to me, Gain... Gone gave him more respect than he did to Dontel Mays. And Dontel Mays is much bigger than Tanner Bozer. Uh, way less experienced and and not as, you know, complete or good of a fighter. Um, but he had his respect right off the hop, which was pretty... Um, it said a lot to me, to be honest with you. That said a lot to me. And then his t in his uh, UFC debut, he fights Daniel Spitz, who's huge, about 6'7" had uh, probably almost at least six inch reach, something like that, plus five inches. And he still got picked apart, uh, picked apart by Bozer, mostly with leg kicks. His, uh, the, the Anik and the guys were joking that his leg looked like a brain, which it kind of did, it was gross. He picked it apart inside, outside, mostly inside leg kicks. So again, if, if Felipe Linz had damage to that left knee, and Tanner Bozer starts kicking the crap out of it, he could be in some prob some trouble, even just mentally. If you know that you had an injury on that knee and someone's kicking the crap out of it, it's going to play a little bit of a, uh, you know, a role on your mind. It's going gonna, it's gonna to play on your mind, I should say. Um, you're going to be concerned about it for sure. Um, and then maybe overcompensate, but... He's a former uh, unified, unified MMA guy, which is an Alberta... Uh, promotion regional promotion that I really like. Uh, he was the UF or the heavyweight champ there last time out. Beat Jared Kilkenny, which is an old throwback name in Canadian MMA. But uh, and then he went to ACB, which is a Russian promotion, and uh, lost some, beat some. You know, it was it was a pretty uh, even record over there in Russia. Um, so I, I think that this fight goes relatively similar to the Andre Olovsky fight with Felipe Linz. I think Tanner Bozer can beat him to the punch, be more active. Like I said, neither of them are extremely volume strikers, super active strikers, but I do suspect that Tanner Bozer would be more, more active. Um, he's only been knocked out once, and that was uh, by uh, Tim Haig. Rest in peace, Tim Haig. Uh, first round, six seconds in uh, his first... It was his first loss, you know, back in the unified days when he was kind of just getting going. So I'm not really sure what happened there. I didn't see the fight, but it was six seconds, probably warranted. I'm not sure. Um, other than that, he's never been knocked out, and his 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 uh, his strength of competition has gone extremely way up. From no no disrespect to uh, Tim Hag or Jared Kilkenny or any of those guys, but it's gone up quite a bit from there. Um, so who am I picking? Tanner Bozer, obviously, Canadian kid, local guy. Um, he's got the one of the best mullets in the game. Looks like he's Australian. Like if you saw this guy, you'd, you'd be like, that guy's Aussie for sure, but he's not. He's from rural Alberta. But um, I like him to win this fight. It's a flip, but 
uh, to be honest, I'm I wouldn't I would think that Tanner Bozer is the favorite in my opinion, and that's who I'll be betting on is Tanner Bozer. Uh, six to one on a finish has me interested. That has me really interested. Um, he's not a, exactly like a knockout artist, especially not kind of lately. But I've seen Felipe Linz get knocked out from some kind of glancing blows. Plus, Bozer can just leg kick the crap out of him until he crumples. He's done it multiple times in the past, and he can do it again, especially if it's that left leg and he, he hits his injured and formerly injured surgery repaired left knee. It might play a, a role in that fight. I think it will. Um, so it's got me interested. The 2.6... I like to go the distance, but to be honest with you, I probably just take the money line there just because they're heavyweights and they're throwing big hands, big leather. I'd rather just take the win for Bozer than uh, that decision money. I'm not getting an extreme amount more. If it was three and a half or so, yeah, I'd be jumping on that, but it's not even a full point. So I won't be, I won't be touching that. Um, but the six to one on a finish as my attention i'll tell you that much i'm not sure if i'll bet it or not check my bet slips but um it definitely has my attention uh fight to go the distance yes 1.5 no 2.5 uh again it's risky i'd rather just take i'd rather just take uh bozer for the win you know if you, if you really think Linz is going to win this fight then go ahead but i i've got bozer the over under rounds and 1.25 on your money i'd rather just take bozer for the win because i'm just as confident well not just as i guess like i'm fairly confident it goes over a round and a half but unless you got like a ton of runners and you're just looking for a little bit more juice on a crazy dart throw parlay i don't know so there you go i mean i'm i'm picking tanner bozer and i'm gonna bet on tanner bozer too so check my bet slips let me know what you think in the comments and let's move on all right, next up, we got a good one. Uh, the Violent Bob Ross, Luis Pena is back, and uh, Kama Worthy, the Death Star. So this should be should be good, should be good, but it's extremely tough to project. At least for me, it's been pretty tough to project this one. Uh, we'll start with uh, Kama Worthy. Um, Orthodox fighter, he's got decent boxing, but he's really heavy on his lead leg. Really kind of boxing base, heavy on that, flat-footed on that lead leg. Uh, he's got power hands, bit of a suspect chin. I don't know if I'd call it really suspect, but he's uh, he's one end lost by KO, and he's kind of a take one to to give one type of a fighter. He's on a uh, six fight win streak with only one of those coming in the UFC. Um, but it was against Devonte Smith, who's a very talented fighter, and it was a first round uh, TKO finish. Um, Finished four of his last of his six last six wins. He's kind of he's kind of struggled against long rangey strikers. His uh, his second loss of his career and only his third fight came against Paul the Irish Dragon Felder, who is a fantastic fighter. Um, lost to Billy Corintillo, who's also long rangey type of guy. Kyle Nelson, who can fight long. Anthony Reddick, who is tall and long, that kind of a thing. You see, I'm kind of getting clearly getting a uh, a bit of a narrative going here. Um, so move over to Luis Pena, who is a long, rangy. I wouldn't call him a striker. I would call him uh, pretty well rounded, but he uh, he's definitely more of a wrestler than he is a striker. Um, he's diverse with his strikes, tons of kicks, long, lanky, tough to take down, and he's always fishing for subs in there if uh, if you do get him down. Um, needs to work on his head movement a little bit, and uh, he, carry, he, he lifts his chin a little high, which is concerning. It's very James Vick, you know? Solid, solid wrestler. So he needs to work on that head movement and keep his chin tucked. That's something he definitely needs to work on. You could say that he's 10 and 0, much like um, Brahima. You could say he's 10 and 0. That split decision loss to Matt Frivola. I actually, I, I remember scoring it for Pena, and I rewatched it, and I it's close. But I would have rather see Pena win that fight, to be honest with you. And uh, split decision loss to Michael Trezano as well, who's a very good fighter. Both those guys are very good fighters, but. 
Um, you could easily say, I mean, it was a split decision. You could say they could have went the other way, and he's 10-0 and 0 right now. If he is, he's probably in a bit of a different position, but this is a good matchup either way. Um, so how, And uh, Luis Payne is a southpaw, which is obviously a thing to remember. There could be a left high kick, head kick, on the menu for, for Worthy. That could be something to look out for. Um, but Pena just doesn't have a ton of power, if I'm being honest with you. So he in his early in his early early in his career, he had a lot of finishes, uh, mostly by submission. Um, when he was an amateur, four of his five fights were by submission win, one was a loss. Um, and then four of his first five fights, which were all wins. Four were by submission. Uh, guillotine, triangle, rear naked, Kimura, different, right? He's fishing different and transitioning to different subs all the time. But Kama Worthy's not going to take him down. So I expect this to take place on the feet. I do. Um, unless Luis Pena wants to wrestle Worthy, which he probably will. So how I kind of see this fight going down is either... Pena picks him apart at distance or Worthy hits him with a with a with a punch, a decent punch and um Pena takes him down. Here's what I I do kind of like about Pena. I I kind of like it is in the Steve Garcia and Steven Peterson fights he's 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 it's most important that he wins, which is very smart and it's a smart way to fight obviously. You literally double your money if you win. Like you get your money to show and your win money. You don't get the win money if you don't win, obviously. So, and he knows that and he wants to make more money. So it's most important that he gets the win. Then the finish comes kind of second. So the odds makers are basically saying that Pena wins this fight and he either taps him out or it's decision. Either way, he wins the fight. I agree. Um... I'm not entirely sure if there's tons of value there though. So 1.4 on the money line. Decent, this decent value. I'll probably take that somewhere. You know, I'll probably take that somewhere. I don't love the finish money though. It is a full point, 2.4, but I I'm I just don't love it. He he hasn't finished anyone since Matt Wyman. And before that, so if we cancel out the Matt Wyman uh fight, which was you know, Matt Wyman really should not have made a comeback, let's be honest, but uh, he did. Uh, Richie Smolin in his UFC debut, in both of their UFC debuts, um, that was his last knockout, which was, you know, two years ago. He's been pretty active. I just don't know if he's got the power to knock Okama worthy. Unless he picks him apart and picks and picks, picks, and then gets the TKO, which is possible. Could do that. But and he, he could sub him if he takes him down. And that's the only way that he does. Because Kamal Worthy's not going to... I highly doubt he, he tries to wrestle with um, Luis Pena. I highly, highly doubt it. And then on the flip side, you know, Kamal Worthy has some serious power. So he, you know, theoretically, he could just drop uh, Luis Pena. That's for sure. That could definitely happen. Um but I, I likely won't be betting on it. I'll probably just just sprinkle Pena in one or two parlays, and I won't hedge with Worthy. Um, I'll just bet on Pena. But I what I'll likely do is hedge on over one and a half rounds. I'll probably hedge that. 1.5 on your money for one and a half rounds. I think that there's a pretty good possibility that that happens because I don't suspect that Pena is going to knock out Worthy. And... I've seen Pena eat some pretty good punches and he's long and lanky and he can move well and he's just got to watch that chin. But but that's what I'm kind of going with. Check my bet slips. I'm picking Luis Pena to win this fight as well. If I didn't say that yet, I'm picking Luis Pena to win. And uh, I will probably sprinkle him somewhere and hedge with the over one and a half round. So check my bet slips. Let me know what you think in the comments and what you're betting. And let's move on to the to the next fight. Next up, we got a featherweight bout between a late replacement, uh, Julian Arosa. Kyle Nelson was supposed to be fighting uh, Sean Woodson here, but had to pull out due to visa issues. He's Canadian, so I'm assuming he was in Canada and they just wouldn't give him a visa for it. It is what it is. 
Um, and uh, Juicy J must have been ready to go. So we got Julian Juicy J Arosa versus Sean the Sniper Woodson. He must have been ready to go and, and close to weight because he is a big guy. And uh, for him to make 145 has got to be pretty top. So he must have been kind of ready to go and uh, waiting in the wings. Um, maybe he doesn't even have a contract right now because after this he probably won't either just saying but um let's start with uh let's start with juicy j i guess uh six one big guy like it's rare that he's gonna be the smaller guy shorter guy at featherweight you know at six one but he is um he's an orthodox orthodox fighter but he can switch um not as much as woodson um fought a southpaw so when he switches he fought southpaw against Devontae smith probably trying to go get him get an advantage there ended up getting ko'd so he, he should just be fighting orthodox especially with a striker like woodson don't try to get cute um carries his hands low which can be okay when you're fighting a shorter guy but woodson is not a shorter guy um you know where he can yeah, just flip out the flip out the jab and just keep the shorter guy away from him. Honestly, it didn't even really work against Julio Arce. Julio Arce did really well on the feet. So his last three fights, um, head kick vicious, nice, head kick lock out, knockout um, by uh, Julio Arce over him. And then Grant Dawson uh, grinded out a unanimous decision and Devontae Smith knocked him out. So this is his second stint in the UFC um first stint he only got two fights split decision win and then uh ko lost to ishihara teruto ishihara who i'm wondering where he's at these days actually i'd like to see. anyways um and then uh gets a gets a shot on the contender series beats jamal emers which is a very good win and then rattles off three straight losses against ufc competition so i'm suspecting that he didn't really have a contract with the ufc but uh, they needed a fighter, obviously. They probably had him staying ready in case this happened. Obviously, I think they've got a lot of guys staying ready. And uh, opportunity came, and here he is. Tough matchup for him, though. That's the only thing. Um, move over to Sean Woodson, who is uh, an absolutely fantastic, fantastic striker. Um, throws a lot of everything um, super, super diverse, super long, super lanky. He has a lot of power. Um, and showed some good ground defense against Terrence McKinney. I don't know if you watched that Dana White Contender Series fight, but in the first round, he got taken down, grounded, grinded out. He was defending submissions for the pretty much the whole first round against McKinney. Came out in the second round, same thing. Guy had his back, had the body lock on him, and he did all the right things. Got rid of the body lock, addressed the body lock, got rid of it, got up to his feet, and then ended it with a flying knee it was so nice so so nice and then uh in his ufc kind of debut fights uh crash bokniak kyle bokniak who uh it, it you know i i like bokniak i do he got kind of fed to the wolves as far as um uh his opponents is a beat woodson I can't remember off the top of my head the other guys but yeah he he uh he had a tough kind of route route in the ufc kyle bokniak um but woodson looked great in that fight absolutely fantastic and here's a big thing that i'm going to kind of talk about um i'll talk about right now but in in the next fight is or regardless for a bunch of guys all these lfa guys here's a here's the thing for a lot of these fighters that and everybody's complaining about fighter pay and everything like that and we can have that conversation but I, that's not what i'm really getting into what i'm getting into is these these fighters that come from uh Sh shamrock fc uh lfa rfa rfa is lfa now but regardless um lfa uh cffc ces all these other all these other regional promotions and then they get their first ufc fight yes they're only making about 10 and 10 12 and 12 8 and 8 maybe but at, in lfa and stuff like that they're making like a thousand and a thousand 15 and 15 maybe two and two t absolute maximum so a lot of these guys even losing they're losing a ufc fight like look at max roshkop 
I guarantee you in that loss, he made more than his entire fighting career. I guarantee it. And that's the same, same thing with all these guys. So once they get that UFC money, it allows them a little more freedom, right? It might not be a ton of money and I'm not arguing fight or pay. That's not what we're talking about right now. I'm just saying that it allows them a lot more freedom. And that's a guy like Woodson. That's a guy like Brahima. That's a guy like uh, Allen, who we'll talk about in a minute. That's uh, Dacus, Dukas, Dacus. Yeah, Dacus, Kyle Dacus. Or, yeah, we'll get to him. All these guys that are coming up from the regionals, now they're making that UFC money. They're getting wins. They're making about 20 grand, which is big. That's a lot of money for these guys. And it allows them more freedom in their training. So, yeah. He got the win against Kyle Bokniak in his UFC debut, made a little bit of money off it, and uh, allows him a little bit more freedom to train even more and a little more, even more seriously. And that's kind of what I'm getting at. So to be honest with you in this fight, I really don't give Julian Arosa a shot. I, re I really don't. Um, even if he tries to take him down and wrestle with him, I think Woodson can neutralize him considering what he was able to do with McKinney. And for any amount of time on the feet, it is literally only a matter of time before he knocks him out. If Julio Arce can knock out Julian Arosa with a head kick, you better believe that Sean Woodson can do the same. And he's got better hands, longer, all these things. Um, it was a late replacement, so there's no real lines on him that didn't come out yet anyways um i'm assuming they will come out by saturday but um i would to be honest i suspect the knockout money for woodson to be like one and a half maybe like 1.72 or something like that and then like uh 2.87 maybe something like that for a decision but you better believe it's going to be heavily weighted towards uh towards sean woodson and it should be because he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna win this fight so 1.22 it came down even i think it was at 1.25 before which is pretty fair i'm I'm probably gonna put this in every single parlay i made because i'm extremely confident that sean woodson beats up julian arosa very confident um so we'll see check my bet slips if i do anything else as far as uh the lines are concerned when they do come out check my bet slips and uh yeah i, I think this is going to be a beating so and, and most likely the last time we see julian arosa in the ufc unless he gets another shot you know later on uh we'll see but uh let me know what you think in the comments and let's move on all right next up we got another heavyweight bout we've got the crochet boss maurice green versus john volante um let's start with uh John Volante, who's moving up from light heavyweight 205, which is to me a little bit concerning. Um, he wasn't, he's not, and he wasn't a huge, huge light heavyweight. Um, I didn't think that he had an extreme amount of trouble making the weight. Uh, maybe he took this fight on a little bit of late notice. Maybe he was planning on moving to heavyweight, anyways. I'm not really sure, but we'll start with John Volante. He's got a good chin, heavy hands, um, really good counter puncher, but more or less just a puncher. Doesn't offer a ton in the kicking game. Um, last time out against uh, Michael Olegjechuk, he takes the first round TKO loss, which was a body shot, which is something to remember. It was a big, big body shot. It was not a punch in the head or yeah, face, nothing like that. Before that, gets a split decision win against uh, Ed Herman. Loses to Sam Alvey, beats uh, Barroso. These are split decisions. He had four split decisions in a row. Two went his way, two went the other way. Four split decisions. That's nerve wracking. Um, third round TKO loss to uh, Shogun Hua, which was fun. Really good fight. And then uh, before that, he knocked out uh, Saperback Safarov. So. Yeah, he's got some good wins on his, you know, he's got some good wins, some good losses, a few too many split decisions on his resume. I uh, knocked out Corey Anderson five years ago. Um, he's been knocked out. He's knocked guys out. He's kind of just, uh, yeah, he's, he's kind of just been uh, a guy on the roster. You know, if I'm being honest, he trains with Chris Weidman. Um, you know, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's a fighter and that's what he likes to do. That's what he knows. And, uh, yeah, seventeen and seven or seventeen and eleven is his record. 
He's just a, he's on the roster type of guy. Move over to Maurice Green. This guy is an absolute true heavyweight, 6'7", 250 roughly. Um, orthodox, he can switch though. He's a former uh, glory kickboxer. So he's he's got that in his back pocket. Uh, he's got a lot of leg and teep kicks, um, obviously with the kickboxing backgrounds, uh, push kicks, just tons of kicking, which is interesting because John Vellante, not a lot of kicks. Um, He's he's not bad off his back. Um, he's not he's not bad off his back. He's not he's not super happy to be on the floor, but he's not terrible being down there. I really don't suspect this hits the floor. I, I really don't. I think John Vellante is going to stand and bang with him, and the first guy to fall falls. Um, Maurice Green has been knocked out. Um, Sergey Pavlovich, who's fourteen and one. Very, very good striker. He knocked him out, but he did knock out Junior Albini. Triangle choked Michelle Batista. Um, he's got a couple triangles on his resume, but again, I don't particularly see this hitting the ground. I really don't, and I think all those triangles were off his back. Um, uh, last time out, he lost via armbar to Alexei, Alexei Olenek, and then again, Sergei, Sergei Pavlovich. So those two guys, his last two, his last two opponents have been uh, pretty solid opponents. Um, Olenek was ranked at the po at that time. I think they were kind of they're trying to. I feel like the UFC is trying to get Murray Screen some wins, and you know he's got the makeup, he's got the body, he's got the build, he's got the skills for the most part um, to to at least get in the heavyweight rankings, and uh, maybe someone they can have like main event some um, fight nights and stuff like that in the future. But he's got to rattle off some wins, obviously, and get in those rankings. And this is a good fight to do that. I'm I'm picking Maurice Green. I, uh, he's going to have a huge reach advantage and a huge height advantage, strength advantage, everything. He's going to have all the advantages in this fight, in my opinion, and especially because I, I do not expect John Vellante to try to take him down. If he was going to wrestle him, I, I'd give him a shot. I mean, if John Vellante was going to wrestle him, I just don't think he does. Um and he just got stopped with a huge body shot. So if if Green can can hit some like push kicks to the belly and stuff like that and chew up his legs and stuff like that, I think it's going to be tough for John Vellante to win this fight. I really do. Um, so let's. I'm picking Maurice Green. Take a look at the lines. Five to one for John Vellante to knock him out, though. That's interesting. Like that's. A lot in a heavyweight fight and a guy like John Vellante that's knocked people out and a guy like Maurice Green that's been knocked out I mean yes it's at a lighter weight class but those are still some heavy hands man and he was probably 120 or sorry 220 on fight day 225 on fight day John Vellante something like that you know most have most light heavyweights are around that range um so he could just clip him, man. That's not crazy. I don't suspect that, and I likely won't be betting this. I, I think this will be similar to the Luis Pena fight for me. I will bet it, but I won't um, I won't bet it on every card, and I'll hedge in different ways, like betting probably a no to go to the decision or under uh, two and a half rounds. You know, you're getting almost one and a half to your, on your money there. You're getting the same or better odds uh, for just someone to finish, regardless of who, than you would for Maurice Green to win the fight outright. You know, 1.9 for a KO, sure, sure, but I don't know. John Vellante hasn't been knocked out a ton of times. You know, it's not like he's just getting dropped left, right, and center out there. Um, if that, if that, his last time out against uh, Ola Jaychuk, if he took a punch in the head and got knocked out, that would concern me more than the body shot he took. He probably just broke some ribs. It is what it is. You know, happens. Um, and then Shogun Hua three years ago. Yeah, I mean, that's Shogun. And then Tom Lawler five years ago. So it's not like he's getting knocked out, you know, like I said, left, right, and center. Um, but I, I think there's a good possibility that someone gets finished in this fight. So under two and a half rounds, 1.3, that's kind of how I'm going to hedge this, if you know what I'm saying and what I'm, what I'm kind of explaining what I touched on earlier. Um, I wouldn't go over one and a half rounds, that's for sure. Obviously, it's a heavyweight fight, which makes me nervous for sure. Um, decision money, again, that's just sketchy. That's sketchy. 
um, five to one for uh, either guy. And I don't know. I, I don't think I touched that. This is too. That's just too much variance, and it just makes me way too nervous. So I probably take Maurice Green one point four four, and I hedge it in uh, in my uh, round betting or fight to go the distance, like I explained. So. Yeah, there you go. Let me know what you think in the comments and who you're betting on, and let's move on to the next fight. Next up, we got Brandon Allen Allen versus Kyle Dawkins. Uh, 185 middleweight scrap. This should be maybe fight of the night. This is actually the fight that I'm probably looking forward to and the most interested in. This is a very, very interesting fight. Very fun fight. It's kind of a... I'm not sure how this is going to go. Um, I think that Kyle Dawkins has better Brazilian jiu-jitsu and Brandon Allen has better wrestling. So they might just slug it out. <laughs> I, I don't know. Like that, that might be how, a lot of times that's how it goes. If guys think they're going to cancel each other out on the floor, they'll just stand and bang and then see, see who, you know, has better striking. Go from there. Um, it's the former CFFC middleweight champ versus the former LFA champ. So LFA versus CFFC. Uh, that should be kind of interesting. I think that that's kind of a, a little bit of a storyline, if you ask me. Um, yeah, which, which regional promotion is better? I don't know. I think that that's kind of cool. And much to like I was saying in, in the earlier fight, these guys are now making UFC money. I'm not, again, I'm not here to talk about fighter pay. I'm not, that's not what this is about. I'm not talking about whether guys are underpaid or whatever, whatever. What I'm saying is they're making more money than they ever made on the regional circuit. And that is just a fact. So Brandon Allen has had a couple fights in the UFC where he's making, yeah, 10 and 10, 12 and 12. Kyle Dawkins was back in the minors. CFFC probably making 15 and 15. You know, 18 and 18, two and two, maybe something like that. Like certainly not enough to live on. So Brandon Allen has a bit of an advantage as far as that's concerned, in my opinion. Um, we'll start with uh, we'll start with Kyle Dawkins. He, uh, like I said, CFFC middleweight champ. He had a good amateur career, which I do like. He was he was probably old enough and good enough to to start his his professional career earlier than he did. But I kind of like that he did what he did. And he stayed uh, as an amateur for a good like 10 fights. Went pro and now he's undefeated. Um, and he won all of his fights by uh, submission except for his, um, his uh, Dana White Contender Series fight, which is a, a slight step up. And that guy, I don't know how that guy survived, if I'm being honest with you. I don't know how that guy survived that fight. Um, so he could be 9-0 and with nine finishes which is interesting on these odds, but we'll get there. Um, so yeah, won the won the CFFC middleweight champ, the belt, and then got a two, Tuesday Night Contender Series shot um, and got the win, but didn't, didn't get the contract. Goes back down to CFFC, defends his belt a couple times, wins with Bravo chokes twice. And that's the thing, man. This guy is a, a strangler, man. That should be his nickname, Kyle the Strangler Dawkins, because he's got eight, eight submissions, all chokes, different chokes, a couple Bravos, no, four Bravos and three rear naked chokes. So he's dangerous, man. You better protect your neck with this kid. Absolutely. And then when he was an amateur, he's got a few triangles, guillotines, more Bravos, rear naked, key lock. He's kid is game. He is absolutely game. He's um he's a forward fighter, pressure forward fighter, well rounded, ridiculous chokes, like I said. Good one to okay power, but he doesn't have any KOs. He's not out there knocking anybody out, but um, but he, he he definitely can. He definitely has some power. Here's why: he was a former heavyweight when he was an amateur. He's a heavyweight. This kid, so you can kind of see it in his body. If you haven't seen him before, you will. Um, you can kind of see that he he looks like he used to be a bigger guy than he is now. Um, and he's always fishing for chokes on the floor, transitioning. You know transitioning um submission attempts transitioning to get better position he, yeah this kid's very very game on the floor he is an improving striker but he's very game on the floor um let's move over to brendan allen yeah lfa 
middleweight champ. This will be his third fight in the UFC. Again, he is a pressure forward fighter, a pressure forward wrestler for the most part. He's always looking to get his hands on a guy. He's got really solid jujitsu. He's uh, a brown belt in jujitsu and uh, had a crazy good comeback against Kevin Holland. Um, who's a very good fighter. That fight, again, is another fight that could have taken easily taken place in the LFA, um, but it happened in the UFC, which was awesome. Kevin Holland had him cut, bleeding, almost choked, and then he comes back and gets a rear naked choke in the second. Um, and then his last time out, he fights Tom Breeze and gets a uh, first-round TKO finish with elbows. So he's had two fights in the UFC where he's making money making decent money and he fought them both within about five months so you can say let's say he made you know 20 grand minimum made 20 grand sorry 40 because he won both so 10 and 10 10 and 10 so he made about 40 grand in his in his in five months in these two fights i'm not here to say that's good or bad money that's not what this is about the bottom line is it's more money than he ever made fighting so now he can it opens him up to be able to train differently better more often quit his job whatever it is uh because he's he's got a little bit of wiggle room there you know and he's going to invest in himself i'm sure that's what most people would do why of course you would right so february was his last fight we're now june not that far away it's not like he should have like blown all that money he very well could have quit his job focused 100 percent on training and that's probably what he did. 24 year old kid, and he's already got uh, 17 fights. 24 year old kid had a had a belt, didn't lose as an amateur. His only losses came to Trevin Giles, Eric Anders, and uh, Anthony Hernandez. All guys in the UFC now. Um, yeah, man, I like this kid a lot. This is just a ton to like with Brandon Allen. An absolute ton to like. And this is just a fun fight. This is a really good fight. I'm really, really excited. And I'm really, like I said, I'm really interested to see where this takes place. I would, I could very much see this be just a stand up battle and they just bang it out because they're relatively equal on the ground. I would probably give, like I said, wrestling to Allen, BJJ to Dawkins. So they might just cancel each other out, not take the chance on the floor, bang it out on the feet and see who falls kind of a thing. Um, I, I hope that. I hope we see both. I hope we get a little bit of both, to be honest with you. But we'll see. Either way, who am I picking? I'm going to pick Brandon Allen to win this fight. I think he is very well-rounded. I'm not going to say more well-rounded, well, well but I think he is very, very well-rounded. And uh, like I just kind of went off about, he's been thwarted the liberty of training better, different, easier, He's got a little bit of money in his pocket, a little jangle in his pocket now. So he's got that opportunity that Dawkins hasn't quite gotten yet. So I think Brendan Allen gets this win. Am I going to bet on him? Probably. I'll probably bet on him. I will probably, again, this is another one that I'll probably hedge with the over one and a half rounds. That's even good money. 1.72 for over one and a half. I think that there's a very good possibility this goes to a decision where they kind of just neutralize each other. And, uh, you know, if somebody gets clipped, they take the other guy down to, in, and they neutralize each other on the floor and it's a grindy type of fight. You know, I could absolutely see this going over one and a half rounds. So I will most definitely be taking that. Um, to go decision 2.75, I don't even mind that. Like, I don't mind that at all. But it's a little... It is a little risky because these guys are both finishers. Um, yeah, only two, only two of their wins to, between both of them. Two of their wins have gone the decision. So I don't know if I go that far where I take this uh, to the distance money, but over one and a half rounds, I really don't mind that number. Um, I don't go with the finish money for Brandon Allen, one point eight. I really, I don't go with that. Um, I'd rather just take the money line if I'm being honest. But five and a half to one on your money for Kyle Dawkins to land a sub. Not crazy, man. It's not crazy. Even seven and a half in the decision, not crazy. I I like this might be one of those times, and we'll see. We'll see. Keep an eye on my bet slips because. I might bet this differently as the card goes along. If I if I get into trouble or start losing some money or whatever, I'll probably throw something on Kyle Dawkins, try to make it back. Five and a half, 
seven and a half. Those are good, solid numbers. 3.4 even. Like, those are good numbers. I don't think the spread between these guys is that massive. I really don't. The only, the, like I said, the big difference is Brandon Allen has been afforded this, this potential to, to train more and better and harder and different than Kyle Dawkins and then he that he could earlier in his career right um so yeah I don't I'm like I don't know what uh, I gave you a lot to chew on there I gave you a lot to chew on I'm definitely picking Brendan Allen um but let me know what you think this is a tough fight it's a lot tougher and a lot closer than these odds are uh are giving it in my opinion and watch since I say that Brendan Allen will just drop him in the first round and make me look dumb but <laughs> it is what it is if you're afraid to be wrong you'll never be right um but either way let me know what you think in the comments who you're betting on check my bet slips let's move on to the co-main event all right next up we got one of the weirder ones one of the weirder fights we got uh platinum mike perry versus mickey gall let's start with mickey gall so Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt with good sweeps. Not a great wrestler, but solid ground grappling. If he gets on top, he's okay, but he's not He's not a great takedown artist. He's not a great wrestler. Um, needs to get the fight to the ground or at the very least against the fence is kind of what he needs to game plan, in my opinion. Um, more recently than earlier in his career, he seems to want to stand a little bit which is not a great idea um orthodox fighter um yeah that's mickey gall let's look through his record here uh i think he went two and oh but i think he actually went five and oh as an amateur um and then second fight second professional fight was in the ufc and i think it was just to to get cm punk a opponent um mike jackson phil brooks CM Punk, obviously, and uh, Mickey Gall. I think they all fought each other. It was like, yeah, we, we don't have anyone who's not good for you to fight CM Punk. So we have to get somebody in here and at least, you know, get them their name out there for you to fight. And he still got beat up viciously. Um, but so Mike Jackson... First round rear naked choke. CM Punk, first round rear naked choke. Sage Northcutt, second round rear naked choke. I don't put a ton of stock into those fights. I really don't, especially like CM Punk and Mike Jackson. I don't put any stock into those fights. I really don't. Those could have been on most amateur cards, if I'm being honest with you. That's just a fact. Um, Sage Northcutt, that's a reasonable win, but he is not good at all on the floor not good at all on the floor um which is what happened uh the george sullivan fight i don't put much stock into that either so i'm skipping one george sullivan he gets a rear naked choke in this first round again i don't put much stock into that fight i really don't uh loses to diego sanchez second round just ran out of gas that's absolutely a fight that he should have won like you really, guys really can't lose to Diego Sanchez right now, especially because he's training similar to the way that Mike Perry's training. Um, Randy Brown was a was a good opponent, his best opponent by a bunch, in my opinion. Um, Randy Brown was a good fight, and he took a unanimous decision loss there um, and got wrestled in a lot of that. Randy Brown d destroyed him in the first round, uh, Mickey Gall came back and had a big similar second round, and then Randy Brown did this. It was you know the same thing as he did in the first round. He got the win. In his last time out, he bought uh, he unanimous decision win against Salim Tuhadi, who is also does I don't put much stock in. You know he's out of the UFC probably now. Three straight straight losses in all three of his UFC fights. Um, I think that means it's relatively obvious that he doesn't belong. Uh, Kita Nakamura and Worley Alves. Worley Alves is a solid fighter, but Kita Mac Nakamura and yeah, I just I don't think we're, we'll see uh, Salim Tuhadi again in the UFC. Um, it's just not impressive. Mickey Gall is just not impressive, like anywhere. Even his jujitsu, you know, is is good, but it it doesn't seem like it's you know anything spectacular if i'm being honest with you 
Um, I would say Kyle Dawkins probably has better Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu than Mike, Mickey Gall. Probably. It's pretty close anyways. It'd be extremely close. Um, so that's Mickey Gall. Uh, this is just a weird fight. It's such a weird fight. And then we got Mike Perry. We got Mike Perry, orthodox fighter. Big power in his hands. Big time power in his hands. Absolutely. He can knock anybody's block off. Uh, he's got a really good chin. He's very strong as he just deadlifted basically Paul, Paul Felder in their fight and kind of d- just dumped him on his head, lift him up over his head, dumped him. He's strong, strong guy. Uh, throws a surprising amount of kicks. I was actually surprised. I didn't really look at it that way before watching him fight. Um, I was surprised with how many kicks that he actually threw. And it's a good variation, head, body, uh, legs, everything. Um, good head movement and changes, changes angles pretty well. But he does dip his head down. He kind of, he has this like up and down kind of, which is good for changing angles. But you got to watch those incoming punches. And he ate some uh, some knees and punches from uh, like Jeff Neal and Vicente Luque. Lots from Vicente Luque destroyed his face, broke his nose. And Jeff Neal, uh, we'll, we'll get to these fights, I guess. Um, so yeah, he dips his head down a little bit. He doesn't really offer much in the way of uh, wrestling and jiu-jitsu. I'm, to be honest, I'm not saying anything negative about his wrestling or jiu-jitsu. We just don't see it very much. So it's hard to really judge it, if I'm being honest. It's just hard to judge because you don't really see it as much. Um, he just he, he's, a, he's a pretty much striker. And any guy that has any sort of decent ground skills, he, uh, he doesn't do very well with, to be honest. And the only guy is, I guess, really Cowboy Cerrone. Um, they're 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 very very intently and very smartly not putting them against wrestlers or jujitsu guys they're just putting mike perry out there with other strikers and bang it out put on a show give him a bonus and bob's your uncle which is great that's exactly what they should do he's not ranked he's not threatening to be ranked he's 13 and 6 he's uh got more losses than wins in his last uh seven five and two in his or sorry two and five in his last seven fights um but he's super exciting uh relatively big name actually still a relatively big name in the game and uh he's fought a lot of quality opponents so his last time out head kick punches knockout by jeff neal not a soul in the ufc wants to fight jeff neal and i don't really blame him if i'm being honest with you jeff neal is a beast um, before that, Vicente Luque, it's pretty surprising Vicente Luque couldn't finish him, but a lot of people have a, it's, it's extremely difficult to finish Mike Perry, extremely. So that tells you a lot about Jeff Neal. He finished him in the first round when guys like Ponzinibbio, uh, Vicente Luque had to get a, even Alan Joban or uh, decision wins, right? Um, and then, yeah, split decision broke his nose viciously against um, Vicente Luque, gets a win against Alex Oliveira, the, the other cowboy. Uh, there was a, it was funny when they fought, you know, cowboy dances a lot on the end of the ring and, uh, and Mike Perry was doing his little jig in the octagon waiting for him. Before that, armbar loss to uh, Cowboy Cerrone and uh, a split decision win against Paul Felder. Paul Felder's one fight up at welterweight, moved back down to lightweight after that. But he broke his hand or arm, something like that. Arm or hand, right arm or hand in that fight in the first round. So he was extremely compromised and it it, it most certainly showed. I would have suspected that Paul Felder would have won that fight in if he was, you know, if he didn't have that broken right appendage. So yeah, that's that's kind of Mike Perry. The big thing that's no secret, and I'm sure every other show like this is talking about Mike Perry, he's not training with anyone. He's training with his girlfriend, which is just... He's done it before, so I guess we shouldn't be surprised, but it is not what you should be doing at this level. Like, there was a, someone uh, pissed off Woodley. There was a, he had a video on Twitter where she was holding pads for him and it made Mike Perry look bad because he, he he can't he can't punch the way he would if someone who was stronger or at least even knew how to hold pads properly you know 
it was just sloppy. It made him look sloppy, you know? So, and she's going to be his only corner person in this fight, which is just like, oh my God, man. He's trained with a lot of good teams. Um, was it Fusion? Fusion uh, XCL? XL? Fusion XL? He trained with uh, Jackson Wink. I think he trained with Top Team for a bit, American Top Team in Florida. I don't know, man. So it's weird. If Mike Perry was training with Jackson Wink for this camp for this fight, I would I would say Mike Perry's gonna drop him, no problem. Like he's gonna get this win, I think. He's tough to take down. And Mickey Gall's not a great wrestler. Um I honestly will most likely not touch this this fight betting wise. I, I I don't think I'll touch it at all. Just because it's so weird. I have like Mickey Gall does not impress me very much at all. And Mike Perry, not only does he not really impress me, I would think that he would get this win. And here's another thing. I think the UFC really would want Mike Perry to get this win. I think his stock would take a hit if he loses to M Mickey Gall. I think I think his stock takes a hit. So I don't know, man. Like I'll pick. I'm gonna pick Mike Perry. I'm going to pick him to knock him out somehow, you know, second round, maybe something like that. First round. I don't know. I'm, I'm picking Mike Perry and I think he might knock him out, but I don't know, man. It, it, I don't know. There you go. I'm, I'm picking Mike Perry. I'm not betting on it at all. I'm not going to talk too much more about it. That, it's just such a weird fight and I don't like it. And I really don't like that. Mike Perry thinks that he can just take on the UFC with him and his, his girlfriend by his side. I mean, it's just not prudent and it's not gonna lead to a lot of victories long-term. So, I don't know. I, I'm picking Mike Perry. Uh, I don't, I'm not betting it at all. There, there you go. I'm not betting it at all. <laughs> I just won't. Um, so I don't even care. I'm not gonna give anybody advice on, on, on these lines. Um, if you wanna take Mickey Gall, that's what I would do. If I was going to bet on this, if I do, maybe if I get behind, check my bet slips. If I get behind, I will bet on this and I will bet on Mickey Gall. Like I'm picking Mike Perry, but I would bet on Mickey Gall. Five to one on your money for a knockout, KO, sub, probably submission. Nine to one on your money for a decision. Nine to one, that's actually insanely good. But it's just a silly fight. It's a silly, silly fight. Mike Perry, even six and a half for a decision. Four to four to one, just for the fight to go to a decision. I don't know. There's a lot of value here if if you want to take a lot of risk. I just think it's so weird. This whole fight is so weird. This tr his whole training thing is so weird. We'll see what happens. Let me know what you think of this weird fight in the comments and who you might be betting on. And uh, let's move on to the main event. Main event time, peeps. Super excited about this one. Um. Yeah, Louisiana, LSU, as you can tell, it's for my boy, my favorite fighter in the UFC right now, my favorite fighter in fighting right now is Dustin Diamond Poirier, has been since Fightville, I really, really like everything about him, um, you know, champ, interim champ, say what you want, he got there, um, had the belt, made it to the top, paid in full, love the guy. I'm super excited to, to see him back in the octagon here. Dan Hooker, I do really like too. I do. I actually really, really like Dan Hooker as well. Um, I think he has all the tools to get there as well. Um, very similar. They're very, very similar. Um, as far as even experience, uh, opponents are close. Eh, maybe not, but... Um, <laughs> um, well, they're not crazy. They're not they're not crazy, crazy far apart. But um, they're very similar guys. They're very similar guys. They've been hard workers. They've been in the UFC for a really long time, Poirier especially. Um, but uh, Hooker's been in the UFC for six years. People might not know that he's been around for since 2014. You know, he's he's had some some ups and downs, but uh, and and um, some uh, weight class differences. But he's. Uh, He's been around a long time and he's had a lot of good wins. So, 
Yeah, let's get into this, man. This is an exciting fight. I'm extremely, extremely excited for this. Let's start with Dan Hooker. Um, city kickboxing, uh, same as trains with Israel at Asanya. Um, very, very good gym, very up and coming gym for sure. I saw uh, a poll on Twitter earlier and it was what's the best gym, ATT, uh, AKA, and City Boxing. And City Boxing was not in last. It wasn't in first, but it wasn't in last. A American Top Team was first, City Kickboxing, AKA. I don't know about that. I'd put American Kickboxing Academy ahead of City Kickboxing. I'm sorry, I would absolutely put it ahead of them, but I did vote for ATT. Um, either way, um, last time out against Paul Felder, a lot of people thought that uh, Paul Felder won that fight. I, uh, I, I think it really could have gone either way. It was extremely... Um, Barbosa type the Edson or the the Felder Barbosa type of fights they could have gone either way um, and I wouldn't have been really upset either way if I'm being honest like I like Paul Felder a lot as a fighter and I believe like I was rooting for him in that fight but I wasn't upset at the 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 the, the decision it was a split and I wasn't upset that Dan Hooker won and I wouldn't have been upset if Felder won so we'll leave it at that before that, unanimous decision win against Ally Quinta. I I think you kind of have to win that fight for sure if you're uh, if you're wanting to be the champ. That's a guy that's kind of like now he now right now he is and at that time he was and he I think he will be for a little bit. He'll kind of be like the gatekeeper to the top five, um, kind of ranked between six and twelve, sort of area. Uh, at the lightweight uh, in the lightweight division, that's kind of where I think Ally Quinta is right now in his career. Maybe he moves up, maybe he moves completely out. I'm not really sure. We'll see what what his next few fights look like, and then we'll kind of take it from there. But and then before that, knocked out James Vick, which is yeah, like everybody was knock has or does and has been knocking out James Vick, um, especially at 155. Uh, I said it earlier about Luis Pena. Holds his head too high, and that's just not going to end well long term. Um, before that, took a it was a vicious fight against Edson Barbosa, who kicks like a friggin' mule, and uh, he just beat the piss out of Dan Hooker's body. And uh, I'm sure he was not peeing a normal color for a few days after that. Um, very good win for Edson Barbosa, who's just yeah. Always right there. Always right there. Um, before that, he knocked out Gilbert Burns at 155. This was right before, which is interesting because that was only two years ago, and Gilbert Burns is fighting for the, the welterweight title next week. Um, stay tuned for that one. But um, knocked out Gilbert Burns in the first round. I don't think Burns should have fought that fight that way. Um, yes, he has power. Yes, his striking was improving, but he should have just taken Hooker down and tapped him out because he could have done it at any time. He was he's exponentially better than Dan Hooker on the ground. But regardless, that's just how it went down. Before that, Jim Miller, knee, KO, uh, Mark Diakise, guillotine choke, which is interesting. He has uh, seven submissions, but they would have been uh, early in his career um, before the UFC for sure in uh, AFC Australian Fighting Championships. But um, yeah, and then... Another knee KO over Ross Pearson. Lost to Jason Knight, who's actually a ton better than people think. Um, so that's not a bad loss to me. That's the thing. I'll go over his losses in a second. And uh, that's not a bad loss to me. Um, before that, guillotine choke, Eddie David, De, De, Adiva, Adiva. Lost to Yair Rodriguez, which is zero wrong with that. Um, either way, we'll go through his losses now. Loses to Maxime Blanco, Maximo Blanco in his second UFC fight, unanimous decision. Loses to Yair, Yair Rodriguez, uh, two fights after that, another unanimous decision, two fights after that. So he kind of started his UFC career, win-loss, 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 win, and then rattled off four straight, lost to Barbosa four straight, now he fights uh, three straight, now he fights to D Dustin Poirier. Um, but the loss to Jason Knight, there's not a lot wrong with that loss at all. Jason Knight was, uh, um 20 and 2 at that time i believe um 
right around there yeah or like 18 and 2 he said he had a couple losses later on towards the end of his ufc career and now he's fighting bare knuckle boxing i think he should have stuck with ufc type of fighting it's obviously less taxing on the body and he's still only seven 27 years old um jason knight but regardless he's probably gonna stay in bare knuckle for i don't know we'll see we'll see um, he had some f exciting fights in bare knuckles, so do, yeah. <laughs> Either way, might as well put on exciting fights. But um, so then, yeah, rattles off four straight wins. He's looking good. Like he's he's in the prime of his career right now. Is kind of what I'm getting to. He's in the prime of his career right now, and this is the biggest fight of his career by far. Uh, there was a tweet out er, the other day saying um, uh, D the Dan Hooker said. After after I beat Poirier, um, I deserve Gaethje or Khabib. Guys like Tony and Connor will have to call me out. And I tweeted, it's possible to agree and disagree with that. And I think that it's very true. You know, he, he kind of has earned it by staying active and by fighting and working his way up. So he has earned a title shot. If he beats Dustin Poirier, you could definitely say that he deserves a title shot. Um, but yeah, I mean, Tony and Connor right there too. So like I said, it's it's very easy to di agree and disagree with that. And it's okay to do both, you know, it's okay. So that's Dan Hooker. At this level, here's the thing. I don't, I'm not even gonna break the, these guys down how they fight too much because if you watch fighting, you know how they fight. And at this level, once you get to the, the top five of the rankings in every division, they're all so elite that there's not really like matchups. There might be one small thing like Cav kicks or like Edson Barbosa kicks harder than anyone else. So when he was top five at the lightweight, there was a, there was a, a matchup advantage there, right? But with these two guys, it's not extreme. If there's a tiny advantage, it's Dustin Poirier has an advantage in wrestling and in probably jujitsu. That's probably the only advantage he has. Striking, if it's it's a wash for sure, I would put it probably a wash. Um, doesn't mean that one guy can't get the better of the uh, the other. Like Justin Gaethje, or sorry, yeah, G Gaethje and Poirier, uh, Poirier and Alvarez, um, all all those types of types of guys um Holloway you know Pettis even um there's you know and he knocked those guys out he knocked out Eddie Alvarez knocked out uh Justin Gaethje is there an advantage I wouldn't say that they he that he had a striking advantage over those guys for sure especially not Gaethje like no I wouldn't say he had an advantage he just got the better of them um and that's the same with this fight I don't think he, you know I don't think either guy has an advantage in the striking could they both knock each other out absolutely um like i said the one advantage if there is one would be dustin poirier in the wrestling especially and probably jujitsu that's where i would give him an advantage if i was going to so let's move on to dustin poirier um last time out lost the interim strap to uh the to unify the belt with khabib third round rear naked choke it was a good fight man um he was pretty shook up after that one which really really you know sucks when you're a big fan of the guy and you want to see him win and he's he's like contemplating retirement but it was obviously in the moment and i don't think he was going to retire and he didn't and uh it was just in the moment right like you just put everything you had into this you know into this fight and uh all the hours and days and weeks and months of training and preparation and you you came up short pretty tough man like that's extremely tough and it's extremely tough on the mind like it, it it definitely definitely plays on you it's like man if i could work that hard and do that much and still come up short like oh i i can only empathize with that I, I i'm not in that position and i never have been so i can only empathize with that but i can i can certainly understand as an athlete how that must like just tax the mind um before that max holloway five round war Got the better of them through one through four. I think Max Holloway started to pour it on later, but I think I think Poirier threw like 200 punches or something like that. Like he's gonna get tired after a while. And uh, Max Holloway is like extremely hard to knock out. Obviously, he's extremely hard to knock out. Super looking forward to him next week too. Um, before that, uh, 
TKO'd Eddie Alvarez in an extremely, extremely fun fight. Uh, before that, beats Justin Gaethje in the fourth, fourth round, just kind of outlasted him. That was a war too, man. All, all these Poirier fights are just wars. This is why I love the guy. This is why I love Dustin Poirier. You're not getting a bad fight ever. You're never going to be bored. Um, and he wins a ton. He's just a good dude. Ugh. Anyways, uh, before that, body triangle, uh, submission over Anthony Pettis. Uh, no contest, an accidental knee on uh, against Eddie Alvarez. That was unfortunate. That was in their first attempt at fight at fighting, you know, their first attempted fight. Uh, they, they did run it back and get it done. Um, then Jim Miller before that. And against Michael Johnson, he kind of just, he just got clipped, man. It happens. It was the first round. He just got clipped. Um, you know, Michael Johnson's no bum. He's no bum. Look at it. I mean, his record might say something different, but he's not. Trust me. And most people know that he's not. He's not a bum. He's got heavy hands, and he can fight, and he can hit hard. And he just got clipped. It is what it is. Um, four straight victories before that against, you know, Bobby Green, Yancey Medeiros, Diego Fajeda. And then the Conor McGregor fight back at 145, he was just way too emotional. Poirier was just way too emotional in that fight. And I really would love to see that get run back 100%. If, if, um, if, if and when Dustin Poirier wins this fight, I would love to see that fight get run back at 155. Connor versus Poirier, 155, title eliminator. Let's do it. I don't know. We'll see. Um, Rattled off three straight before the loss to Conor McGregor. Lost to Cub Swanson, unanimous decision. Uh, beat Jonathan Brookings, lost to the Korean Zombie, um, beat Max Holloway before. I won, this is at 145 as well. Um, and then Danny Castillo beat him in WEC. So if you look at his losses, zero losses to hang your head about. You got Danny Castillo, who was very good at the time in WEC. This was 10 years ago. Um, Korean Zombie, I don't need to say anymore. Cub Swanson, do I, I don't think I need to say anymore. Conor McGregor, nothing. The Michael Johnson is the only one that kind of got away from him. That's the only fight in, in his entire career where it's like, I should have gotten that win. And that's not a fight that I lose nine times out of 10. You know, if they fought nine more times, I, I'd be willing to bet that Poirier wins nine of them. Um, and then Khabib, who's never lost. So there's nothing wrong with a single loss on Dustin Poirier's career, except for maybe Michael Johnson. But so who wins this fight? If you couldn't tell by the jersey and everything I had to say, Louisiana kid, Dustin Poirier is winning this fight. That's my guy. I'm never going to pick against him. I'm never going to bet against him. He's my guy. I'm, I'm picking Dustin Poirier 100%, and I will be throwing some money on him. Absolutely. And it's not like I think most people think he's going to win this fight too. But um, just look at the strength of schedule is really a big thing for me. Um, and the fact that he got a taste of, you know, the title. He got a taste of the title. And it's right there. It's still right there. If he wins this fight, he deserves a title shot too. You know, this this 155 division stacked. And there's a lot of, you know, sitting out and uncertainty and whatever, whatever, even injuries and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's, it's tough because there's so many guys um, that are just right there. And yeah, that's why I'm, I'm kind of in the camp. This is another discussion for another day, but I'm in the camp that a 165 division might not be a bad idea. There's enough fighters. There's so many guys, so many guys that could, that could be, you know, 155 and 165, two division champs defending at the same time. I know people don't like that either, but it's another belt for the promotion. Well, I'll talk about that some other time, but um, either way, it's right there for him. If he wins this fight, he, he potentially deserves a title shot. Both guys potentially do. Um, but we'll see what happens. That's, that's another story for another day. 1.45 in the money line. I'll probably be taking that. Um, 1.95 for a finish. I'd probably rather take a risk on the decision money. Um, you know, Max took him to a decision. Jim Miller, majority decision. Joseph Duffy, decision. He does finish a lot of people, though. Like, the numbers, are, it's fine. Like, I'm not saying, um, you know, the line makers are out to lunch here, but uh, but there's just not a ton of value there. Like, I'm not taking a half a point on a finish 
you know, it is a five round fight in a smaller cage, but I'm still just not taking that half a point. That's not enough for me. If I'm being honest, I'd rather like dart throw the decision with a couple cheapy runners or something like that. Um, fight to go to the decision. You could just go no. Yeah, 1.36, not bad value. Um, the over under round betting is really interesting. That's a, those are some really interesting numbers. Over one and a half, I think is is a very, very solid bet. That's something you could hedge if you wanted to. And I probably will take that one and a half because it's even more than the money line bet for, for Poirier. So realistically, I might just be taking that um, just because I'm getting better value. Uh, over two and a half, even 1.9, that's good money too. I, I don't expect that this is a just super quick knockout. I don't like these guys know what's on the line here. They absolutely know what's at stake. And I don't think they're going to go out there reckless. So I don't particularly see a quick finish, a quick knockout. I don't particularly see that. Can it happen? Of course. I just don't particularly see that happening. I see them being a little more calculated. So over two and a half rounds, I don't mind that either. I really don't mind that. Um, and then that's probably all I go with. I don't know if I like under rounds in this. I really don't, I don't like the under rounds. Um, I think you're getting better value if you go over. If you look at uh, under um, three and a half, 1.53, I'd rather go over one and a half, you know, for basically the same money. But we'll see. Either way, gave you a lot to chew on. Let me know who you're picking. I'm going with my boy, Dustin Poirier. Thanks for tuning in. Um, enjoy the fights and we'll see you out there. Thank you so much for watching. I sincerely appreciate it. If you're here for the first time, do me a massive favor. Hit that like, subscribe, and turn on notification buttons for me. If you're a fan of the show, do me a big favor. Send it to a buddy, friend, family member, something like that. Build up that subscriber base for me. I'd really like to hit that 200 subscriber mark. If you want to follow my bet slips along Twitter, go uh, at Cody Woodman right there to follow along. Hope you enjoyed the show. And this is Off the Schneid reminding you that if you're afraid to be wrong, you'll never be right.